<laughs> All right, everybody, we'll get settled in. Good morning once again. This is our general manager's panel. So come on back in and have a seat, and we'll get ready to go. I'd like to introduce our general managers here today. Uh, come from very different backgrounds, and I think it'll be a, a fascinating conversation. They're both uh, new to the job, but obviously not new to baseball. Uh, introducing uh, first, from the Arizona Diamondbacks, has been a World Series MVP, a Championship Series MVP, one of the greatest pitchers of the last generation, now the general manager of the Arizona Diamondbacks, Dave Stewart. And also with us is the new general manager of the Colorado Rockies. He has worked his way up through the organization, worked for Major League Baseball, was on the minor league side of things, player development, then got into baseball operations, and uh, an inspiration, I would think, to a lot of uh, you young people out there that are trying to get into baseball or are into baseball and moving their way up, as he has now uh, ascended now to the very top and is the general manager of a major league club with the Colorado Rockies, Jeff Breidich. Good to have you guys here. It's terrific. Now you guys are in the same spot, right? You're both in the same, you know, facility in spring training. We were just saying that we never see each other. Though. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? You're, you're on opposite sides, and so you all have you're in the same spot, but you're different sides. Stadium in the middle. Um, for anybody who's been out the Salt River, uh, beautiful stadium in the middle, and identical footprint in terms of buildings. One on Colorado Rocky side, one on the Arizona Diamondback side, and and really the same plot of land for each, for each team. And um, it's, we, we usually refer to it as the Taj Mahal of, uh, of spring training baseball facilities. Uh, at least now, there's probably somebody that'll, that'll one up us at some point, but we're so fortunate. I'm sure Dave feels the same way. We're so fortunate to go to work there every day. It's incredible. It's beautiful, it's beautiful to come to work, I can tell you that. Uh, looking out of, our, out of my office window, we see the baseball field. And, if you go to the other side, if you're standing up top, you can see all of the, uh, the uh, playing fields for our minor leagues and our big league fields. It's, it's, it's a beautiful place to be. All right, let me start and just ask you, how, you know, what is the job like? In this, in this day and age, Jeff, I know you, just, you, you took over, both of you just took over, but um, it, it seems to be, it's a very, we talked about the front office and the integration of the scouting and the analytics, and obviously we talk a lot about that here. Uh, it's a pretty sophisticated operation at any major league club. What, what is the job like? Um, I'm fortunate in, for me personally in the way that, um, the way that I was raised in, in certain ways in the organization. Uh, I, I do feel like the, the job of a farm director in many ways is a, is a great proving ground. You're, you're always, literally always on. And uh, you have so, so many people to be accountable for and really accountable to um, that, you know, how, how you utilize your time and how you organize yourself is so important. And, and that's, you know, there's, there's so much bleed into, from that into the GM role and that uh, literally I had never, I thought I was busy as a farm director. I, I never truly felt like there were not enough hours in the day um, when you think about the number of people and not necessarily the number of things, but these are living, breathing organizations and the number of people that are looking to you for some sort of guidance or assistance or help or direction or whatever it is, um, that's really unending. And so, you know, the, how you organize that, and, and really at the end, of the end of the day, this is a very much, the way I look at it is a service job. Um, you have to help people do their jobs very well because there's absolutely no way that, that I or, or myself or Dave or any of the other 28 can, can do it themselves. So how do you enable and empower everybody else to do their jobs to the best of their ability? That takes a lot of time and a lot of thought and a lot of effort. How about for you, Dave? What's the job like? Oh, well, it's actually been um, enjoyable most days. Um, I'm really, really fortunate. I've got a good group of people that I'm working with. Uh, Brian Minetti um, is, our, is my assistant general manager. Um, Dijon Watson um, is, in our, is in charge of our baseball operations. I've got a great assistant, uh, Kristen Pierce, um, Sam, Eaton. I mean, I've got a good group of people that, uh, you know, help me and support me um, through the course of my day. It allows me a great opportunity to look at our baseball team um, and try to figure out what we need to do 
um, from a day-to-day -day basis with our baseball club. Um, Mike Bell is um, a big, big part of our, our minor league system. He's our minor league director overseeing our kids and he's got great staff and then um, I get, would probably say my best friend and the guy that I trust most, most Tony La Russa. I talk to him on a day-to-day -day basis and we figure out what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis with our ball club, which direction we want to go um, and the philosophy and the culture that we want with our organization. What's most of your day spent doing? Jeez. <laughs> on each day, it's something different. There's a lot of days when I spend a lot of time on the phone um, talking with different teams or with different sources that I may have out there just so I can keep a pulse on what's going on inside the game of baseball. And then there's a day that I may spend just looking at our minor league clubs. Um, and, you know, we're in spring training now with our minor league teams, watching our minor league organizations. I'm also involved in our scouting and looking at some of our top players in the draft. Um, and then, you know, we've got our major league club, making sure that I stay close to our manager and our coaching staff there. So each day it's something different. It's never the same every day. Jeff? Yeah, a very similar answer. Um, you know, we're obviously we, we're an organization that is um, kind of emerging from a, a transition period or, or a, a period of flux. And so we've been very focused on each other and we've been very focused on, um, on what our, how we're going to define our culture moving forward and how we're going to together move in, in directions um, that are going to help us, uh, not just at the major league level, but you know, that trickle-down effect um, the, into player development, into scouting, into PR, into you know, marketing. And I mean, the, it, it's a very interconnected um, process, a major league organization. So, We've been focused very much inward, and and, and how we how we communicate our relations, and you know, in addition to basically everything that, that Dave just said, you know, there there's that the specific job of a GM. You could, you know, I mean, you could pick one little thing about your about the organization that you work for and focus on that intently for a 24-hour period and never come up for air if that's how you do it. I mean, there's so many different things that you could do. So. Um, you know, but as, as minor league, uh, you know, as our, our player development on the minor league side gets going more f full, I don't know where you guys are at, but we're a couple days away from, from being full go um, on our minor league side. So um, to this point, it's been internal culture, uh, major league based, and, and as the, the days go on, it'll, it'll transition and more kind of timeshare for me between our major league side and our minor league side. When we started this job, we both weighed 270 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little more than that, I think. You're being generous. So. Uh, it's funny because I think when we think of uh, general managers on a on a day to day, I know in the media we think of trades and trade rumors and you know, when obviously then free agency during the free agency period. How uh, how much time is spent? Because you just laid out, I think it's pretty impressive when you think about all the things that these men have to do on a daily basis. Because you are, you're running your organization. There's so many people you have to answer to and, right, and, and answer for. Um, but then how much of a time do you spend thinking about, hmm, we have a need, boy, I'd like that player. Or we hear every day about, oh, it's Cole Hamels. Like how often do you start thinking about, hey, what trades can we make? Um, I, I, a lot, uh, you know, brutally honestly. I mean, there's, you know, I, I tend to read the same, you know, websites or, or you know, get the same information that, that most baseball, you know, ardent baseball fans do. Um, you know, I've got a little bit more direct access to, you know, to uh, to information maybe, and, and and being able to call some people and, and find out uh, what their thought process is on other teams. But you know, look, I think your question really is about how do you organize yourself. Um, and uh, spring training is a, it's an interesting time. It's a pressure cooker. Um, and it's, it's kind of like the, the winter meetings in a lot of ways, right? I mean, we, we have our routines and we, we have, and then we go into, into the winter meetings for a week and it gets, and it gets crazy, you know, and, and your world is kind of weird again and it's turned upside down and you're in a, in a weird place in a hotel and you've got some of your guys around you and you don't really have some others and you're, you know, I mean, you're talking with the other teams, but not really because you're still texting and emailing. And I mean, you're just your whole routine is is turned upside down a little bit. Spring training can be the same way, 
um, it's really the, the one and only time in this, in this industry where we're together as a, as a full group. And, and not even entirely because our, our amateur scouts are out doing their jobs and some of our pro scouts are out in Florida doing their jobs and Scott and the other teams. And uh, so you really have to organize yourself well because um, you can, you know, if, if we're organized well as a team and there's a bunch of, of the guys, you know, that are sitting over there in our, in our ops team, you know, we've already done a lot of that work in terms of the players that we want to target, the players that we need to pay attention to on the major league side or even the minor league side, the guys that we know that we need to, um, you know, we need to focus on over the next two months. Um, so if we're, if we're doing our jobs well, I feel like we've thought about that stuff ahead of time. And then we're ready if there's other names that come in or there's things that, you know, then you're ready to maneuver or to, to, to react off of that. How about you, Dave? How much time do you think trades, talking to other GMs about trades? Well, our, our team is a, a very young team. Uh, we've got a lot of young players, young pitchers. Um, and so most of my dealings or our dealings um, probably took place through the winter meetings. Um, we, had, uh, we had the general manager's meetings, the winter meetings. And then uh, once we left that, uh, we were left to evaluate what we, what we would have, which I spoke to you earlier. I was excited about getting to this point to see where we are, to see the guys actually on the field and how they're going to play, um, how we're going to gel together. Um, and, you know, coming into the season, um, for someone outside looking in, you would say that we have some holes and we have some, some gaps that we need to fill. But internally, um, when you're trusting your, your development, you're trusting your coaching staff to help players move along and develop them, um, the picture becomes a little bit clearer. Now, one thing you can't, can't, uh, you can't um, pre predict are injuries um, in, in spring training, and if you have an injury that's going to be crucial to the makeup of your team, uh, then, you know, you, you get out and you try to make a deal. But um, it's gotten to me it, at this point, especially when you, you've got budgetary restrictions as well, um, you now just think about what you can do um, more internally. And if you have the pieces internally to, to be the ball club that you want to be, and um, if you don't, and there's an opportunity to make a trade, you make a trade. But um, I, I, I got to tell you, I slept very little um, in October, November, December. And I'm sleeping a whole lot better now in January and February. <laughs> um, what do you think of this offseason? Dave, start with you. I mean, it's, it, it seemed to be very different, didn't it? I mean, it seemed to, there was a lot of new blood and then old blood getting back into the game and all of these trades. What do you make of that? You know what? Um, you got to take take your hap, cap off to to the teams that uh, were able to pull off multiple major trades. Uh, the San Diego Padres they made multiple moves, major moves, um, changed the whole complexion of their team. Um, my home is in San Diego, and you know I was able to listen to the buzz of of the fans and the community about what what that ball club did. Um, and so when you look at that, the Dodgers, on the other hand, they did things that they felt were going to make their team better, in other words, in other ways. And, um, but the way I look at it, at it all is um, I always look at, at a window of opportunity for, for our particular club. I, I try not to look at what the Padres did, although it's there. You look at the loss of, of a great player for the, for the Giants going to Boston. Um, you look at the Dodgers moving different bodies and still being predicted to be at the top of our division. But um, I like to look at our ball club. I look, like to look at how we're going to challenge teams, how we put our team together, the makeup of our ball club, the things that we're teaching in spring training, and how we'll have impact on the league is, is the way I look at it. Jeff, what did you think, all the wheeling and dealing? Um, not all that surprised, I guess. I think that, uh, you know, it, the element of the Cuban players now, I think, is a, is a big thing. And, you know, it's certainly with Tomas and, and a lot of these guys, it's almost, I mean, he gets the same emails that I do. It's almost, almost daily where there's more Cuban players that are, are out of the country and, and, you know, creating residences somewhere and trying to get signed. And, um, you know, that, that I think has added a, <clears throat> a wild, wild west element to, <laughs> to where we're at right now. Um, 
Excuse me. <clears throat> and it's probably gonna, you know, it's probably gonna force, um, you know, it's probably gonna force us as an industry to to somehow rectify this or or put some some sort of um, more institutional um, constraints or restraints or just rules in place. But not really surprised all that much um, by, you know, especially when there's when there's a lot of change in the front offices. You know, that you tend to see. Um, people evaluating the teams and, and, and having that feeling strong to, to make the changes that they feel necessary. You know, the, the usually the, when there are changes in an, in an organization at the top, it's because the, the, the owners or, or the people in charge want there to be some sort of new wave or new element. So that can a lot of times lead to the type of activity that we saw this off season. How do you use your analytics department if you have yeah, you know, if that's what you call it, or within your baseball operations, how do you use that? We do have an analytics department. Um, they're actually sitting right over there, um, and we are <coughs> we are looking to uh, grow in many different ways. We've, you know, we've look stats analytics. Um, we've used and utilized and made use and made good use of them for a long time. And it, now it's about the how, right? Because there's so much new and there's so much that continues to be new. Um, it's really about the how and how much. It's just like anything else in this game, it's a choice, right? You, you, it's there, it's, there's so much that can be done now um, in so many new ways and different ways. There's so much proprietary stuff that can be done um, in the ways that you want to look at the game. But at the end of the day, um, you still have to decide how you're going to utilize that in your organization and what, what values you place on it. And not just to try to evaluate, you know, major league players. Are you going to utilize trying to evaluate minor league players, college players, high school players, uh, players in, you know, Cuba, don't come back to Cuba. How, can, we, can we safely evaluate stats in the Cuban League as it compares to, um, you know, and on and on and on. Um, you know, we will, you know, we will continue to press forward in that. I think we're going to grow our, our analytics department, probably not in leaps and bounds and huge, huge, huge things, probably very, very specific and pointed ways uh, to try to, to make sure that um, we are aiding our decision-making process. Um, and it's not, for us, I don't think it's a, an either-or situation. It's a, how can we best combine the traditional ways of, of looking at players and really looking at human beings and add, you know, add the ways that, you know, what stats, our, our own proprietary stats can tell us about these human beings so that we can make consistent good decisions. How about you, Dave? What he, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we're, we're building our department. Um, uh, when we spoke uh, this winter, uh, just before I was hired, um, or when I was hired for this position. Um, we had talked about the things that we wanted to do organizationally um, to get better, to catch up with the game as it is today. Um, and analytics was a part of that. Um, and there's a lot of ways to use it. And I don't think that I'll say anything that hasn't been said already by um, Tony La Russa. Um, you can use, we can use analytics in the draft, um, looking at players, um, in particular college players. Uh, I think that there's a place for it that we can kind of find out what these guys are and what they're going to look like long term. Obviously, players do mature and they do change in certain areas, but we can definitely use it there in our minor league system and especially at our, at, with our major league club. Um, are we going to be 90% analytics? Probably not. Are we going to be 30% analytics? Probably not. We're going to find a place. Um, where it's comfortable for us to use both the knowledge of the game, the in-game in experience, to allow the manager um, to do what comes natural for him to do in a situation that takes place in a game. Um, but before we go in the game, give ourselves every advantage that we possibly can um, when that game starts. You know what's fascinating uh, to me in this uh, kind of, you talk about analytics and scouting and um, scattering reports, but just the rise of shifts in the last four or five years. How do you think, I'll start with you, Dave, how do you think 
baseball went 100 years one way, and then in the last four or five years, oh wait, now we're going to do these drastic shifts. How did that happen? You know, I don't know. Um, I'm, I was actually fortunate um, to be in the A's organization uh, with uh, Dave Duncan and Tony La Russa, Renee Latchman, and our coaching staff, and we kept charts on our bench. We looked at film after games to help us with the charts. Um, God, they called me Captain Video because I was always in the clubhouse writing down pitches and taking account the number of, of pitches and, and things like that. But we um, kind of used a form of a shift back in that period of time. Um, not as deep as you see it now where you've got three guys on one side of the infield or you've got one guy as, as your short, short right fielder or short left fielder. We, we weren't that drastic, but we did use a form of a shift back in the day. Um, how it's gotten to this point, Obviously, there's information that, that's been given, that's been put down, it's been written, it's been proven, that shows that this is what you're supposed to do when this hitter comes up. What about you, Jeff? What are your thoughts? First thing I'll say is that Renee Latchman is our bench coach, and he has those charts back in the day, he still has them. <laughs> he he pull, literally pulls them out on these binders and still has charts back, uh, back from decades ago. But. Um, I think that it takes courage. It's all it takes is, you know, the, there's so much copycat in professional sports. And whether it's us, whether it's the NFL, um, the NBA, that, you know, it, it takes courage for one or, or a couple groups of people to say, we're going to do this and we're going to see what happens. And then to evaluate that. And then the rest of us kind of, you know, catch up or make decisions based on that. Uh, I would say that. You know, I, I would probably agree with, you know, certainly he has the playing experience to, to back up that, that sentiment of, hey, look, I, I, I've seen it, I've experienced it behind me as a pitcher where we made some, some educated guesses on where to play. Um, I would say that right now it, it's a combination of um, what we see a lot out of our hitters at the major league level, that the ability or the willingness to hit away from the shift is, is still questionable, and so shifts work. Um, the rise in strikeouts, the, the whole, if you want to say, the whole steroid era in baseball, that, that the players that we are now, in our, that we have in our organizations now that sat as kids and watched that, and were, basically were taught that in, in certain respects as young players, that it's okay to strike out, that you know, swing, you know, swing hard in case you hit it, and and that a, that a willingness to control the barrel and that adjustability and the willingness to think along with or outsmart, you know, try to outsmart Dave Stewart as a pitcher, and I'm gonna, and I know what he's trying to do. I know he's trying. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take what they're giving me. I'm gonna lay that bunt down on the third base line. I'm gonna walk to first. They're so, you know. We're not seeing a whole lot, or we haven't over the last five, ten years seen a whole lot of our major league players willing to do that. They're just going to stand up there and they're going to take their chances, which plays right into the odds of a shift and the whole reason that teams shift to begin with. So, you know, for me, why, why wouldn't you continue to do it? And I think we will continue to do it. We don't do it a whole lot. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to have basically four gold glovers in your infield, but you, you know, I think we will probably do a little bit more here and there, and, and, and why wouldn't you? If, if Major League hitters are just going to, you know, say, oh, I'm going to take my chances, then the odds are likely in the defense's favor. Um, yeah, so why do you think that's happening? Why do you think, um, or can the players who are playing now become those players, or is it going to have to be a wave of players who are now 16 years old who come up and slash the ball and, I don't know, hit... I don't want to just say like Rod Carew because no one can just hit like Rod Carew, but you know, just say, you know, no, I'm going to hit for singles. I'm going to hit it that way. You're not going to be able to shift on me. What, where, uh, can these players do it now, or is it going to take a next wave of players? I, I, I speak as a player, right? Mm -hmm. We're stubborn mules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, don't, uh, we don't make adjustments very, very easily. Um, there's, a, there's the egotistical part that's involved, and then there's the the rest of it that just doesn't allow a player to, to, to hit the ball the other way or to bunt a ball when a guy is giving you a hit. There's that machoism that says, hey, I'm going to hit the ball through the shift or, 
You know, I got a chance to, from a pitcher's point of view, I got a chance to strike this guy out, even though the pitcher is on deck. You, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's just the egotism of, of being an athlete and being in that stage and having people watching you at that moment. And, you know, my dad always told me, never let ego get in the way of good judgment. And a lot of athletes do that. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Jeff? I mean, what he said. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can it happen there's organizationally? So, there, literally, there's so much, there's a lot of truth in that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I do believe that we're talking about skill sets. And I do believe that it, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of focused intent and a lot of hard work. Um, but, you know, there are ways that you can, you know, that, that you can sell or impress upon the players that this is going to help, not only is it going to help our team, it's going to help you at the end of the day. If we want to talk about it from a stats perspective, right? The, 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 you, are, you, you are the best, one of the best baseball athletes in the entire world. Um, you know, the, the, you, you have the athletic ability to do that. Some guys, you know what, they're at the age in their career, they're, they're maybe, they're past that. But I, I do believe that, that if, if you focus on it, you, you will get, you will get results, um, and, and probably pretty soon. I mean, there's, you know, it's just a matter of how much time and effort you, you put into it as, a, as an individual coaching staff or as an organization. You know, even in, um, it's probably in the 70s, you don't have to go back that far, I mentioned Rod Carew, there was singles hitters, you know? There were singles hitters, and you can go back through the, the, the history of the game, and a lot of people who have written about there, uh, John Thorne has written about it a lot. You know, the, the different hitters in 20s and 30s a lot of table setters, just a lot of them. Do we get back to that at some point? Are we morphing back to that? Singles are at like an all-time low. Uh, the shifts are devouring the power hitters. Do you think we get back to more of uh, that sort of uh, way of, of, of hitting and, and, and guys playing for batting average and singles, and will that be effective? I think there's a form of that already. You look at the two teams that played in the World Series last year, you know, Kansas City. Um, they had table setters, and then you had guys in the middle of order that, that uh, drove in runs. Um, the Giants, I don't consider them to be a power hitting club. I consider them to be a, a club that plays the whole game of baseball. They bunt, they hit and run, they um, squeeze. And you know, if you get an opportunity for one of the big guys to come up and you got, you got your lead, lead guys on, on base, they, they get it done. So I think you know, from team to team, you're gonna see different things. And that's once again, an organizational philosophy. But I think that there are enough ball clubs that do have table setters. Um, there, there are enough clubs that, that still believe in, you know, playing every aspect of the game to try to win a baseball game. Um, I believe that things always have a way of coming back around. Um, you go through a period of time and you're doing what you're doing. Like I'm, I'm sitting here, I, I look at my son and, and I, I remember when I was a kid, I used to have a part in my head. Well, guess what? They're wearing parts in their head right now. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when, when you had cuffs in your pants. Well, cuffs are back. Um, we had a period of time when slacks were skinny. Now slacks, that period came and went. So I, I believe that things come back around. Um, and I think that the game of baseball, the great game of baseball, that, that, that we get an opportunity to watch, the athletes that we get an opportunity to watch play the game, um, I think that the game will return back to some of the, some of the things that it's always done. Let me, uh, I should, should have pointed out, if you'd like to ask some questions, we're about halfway done, so you still have time. You can go right in the back there, there's some cards. So write out some questions, um, you know, in the next 10 minutes or so, and we'll have questions from you, and you can ask Jeff and Dave your own questions. I want to get you involved uh, in all of this. So feel free, and then you can get the cards right in the back. Um, Jeff, let me ask you about uh, Colorado. Um, what's, uh, it, it's difficult circumstances. We had uh, Adam Ottavino on, mm -hmm. on the show, uh, one of your relief pitchers, good relief pitcher, and he pointed out, it's just, he said it's just different. You're going from one environment to another environment and things are different. The ball is moving differently. The, uh, some pitches work in Colorado, they don't work somewhere else or vice versa. Um, how do you deal with that? What do you think the plan of attack will be? Yeah, I think there's an element of truth to it. You know, I think that, uh, that playing baseball at a mile high is, you know, it, there, is, there is a difference there. Um, how much of a difference 
is really, I think, an individual type of experience in the game. I think there are some, some players that doesn't really affect all that much and it's not that big of a deal. Some guys that affects more. I mean, we are talking about human beings, right? I mean, and, and, and there, there's a bunch of different, there's different body types, there's different mental makeups, there's different histories that they have coming through the game, there's different skill sets that they have. Um, you know, there are different points. You know, players are at different points in their careers, whether it's um, uh, uh, no experience whatsoever, major league wise, to a ton of big league experience. So, um, I, to to bury our head in the sand and say that that there are, you know that there is no you know effect of playing in Denver, I think is is probably pretty short sighted. Um, it's also I, I think oftentimes painted as kind of the end of the world, and it's in my opinion it's really not. I think adjustments do have. To, I think Adam's exactly exactly right. There are certain small adjustments that experienced baseball players can make. Um, you know, a lot of times, for example, uh, Adam, it's, it's maybe it's where he, the target point on, on his slider. You know, he's going he's gonna to start, try to start it here instead of here, or here instead of here. Um, you know, but look, whether it's going from Denver to San Diego, or it's going from, you know, the Dodgers or the Padres or the Giants in massive pitchers parks and, and having to play in Philadelphia or Milwaukee or coming to, to Denver, um, Chicago White Sox. You know, it, you, you have to make, as a player, as a team, you have to make small adjustments based on where you are. And a lot of times the teams that, that do that the best are, are going to you know, be the most consistent um, teams over the course of, of a season. So, you know, we're aware of it. And I think our players are aware of it, and I think it's a learning process, but I don't think it's some massive, huge adjustments that these players have to make in order to, to make it work. Dave, what have you seen as a, you know, in, in Denver, uh, just going and seeing the different conditions? What, what, what's different, do you think, for uh, the players? I haven't been there with the Diamondbacks yet, but uh, what, how different is the game there? Well, I can tell you this. I wouldn't have wanted to pitch there. <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, the, the, ball, the, the ball does carry, um, and, but you know, as Jeff said, um, if, you, if that's going to be your, your, your home field, um, then you've got to learn to make adjustments, and you've got to learn to pitch smarter and play smarter. Um, as, a, as a team going into Denver, um, you've got to make adjustments, and, and, and more, probably the most important thing being able to, to breathe there. From a pitcher's point of view, being able to breathe and compose yourself um, while you're on the mound, I think is one of the most important things that you can do, um, especially when things get to, they start speeding up. When the game speeds up, you've got to be able to slow it down. A lot of that has to do with breathing. If you're not conditioned for Colorado, uh, that can be a, a difficult thing to do. Now, hitters love going there, obviously, but I think the, the, the difference, um, the biggest difference is, is, is in how pitchers pitch and um, not being able to make as many mistakes as you can make in another ballpark. Um, you know, if you get a ball too much in the middle, the ball that the guy just misses now is just over the fence versus, you know, being a warning track. So um, those are the differences. Will you guys uh, experiment at all with different pitching patterns that you've done <coughs> in the Excuse past? Me. or any? type of difference uh, with the way you pitch? Um, again, it's, you know, it's, I think it's a guy-to-guy -guy type of situation. You know, it's, it's tough to take a group of pitchers and however many pitchers you utilize over the course of a major league season, um, probably going to be you know, 20 to 25 guys potentially, uh, depending on injuries, depending on whatever else, performance, to say that, you know, put everybody under a blanket policy of this is how we, it's, it's not, um, I think it's not giving credence to, you know, the differences and the different skill sets that pitchers have and the abilities that they have. So, uh, you know, I think some of the adjustments at times will probably use 13 pitchers on our, on our staff, um, you know, during specific parts of the season, maybe even more often than not. Um, but again, that's a matter of, of adjusting as well. And how is our, you know, where are we at in the season? How are we doing? What's our, what's our injury situation? What's our health situation? What's, um, but in, in terms of any sort of other, you know, drastic or dramatic um, pitching policies, no. I don't, I don't foresee us using anything too unique or 
Okay, we're crazy. What do you think the, um, what's the next wave, do you think? What's the next, is there a next wave? Is there a next advantage? Is it maximizing performance? Or what do you think the next thing will be? If the last few years were, were was shifting, what do you think the next thing might be? <laughs> oh, I need time to think. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know it, tell us right now, please. Yes. Well, um, you know, certainly the the defense is an easy one. The, you know, the TrackMan stuff that uh, that's coming out, and um, and having real time. You know, the NBA and and. And even the NFL to now a certain degree with the wearables and, and, and their pads and all that kind of stuff, they're, they're starting to change how, um, how quickly data is amassed and just how ready that data is for you to utilize and implement. And, um, and really, you know, when it comes to new waves or, or analytics or whatever it is, the combination of, of a lot of different things, it is how predictive are these things, right? I mean, we can, always, we can always go back now with such ease and say, wow, that guy was a really good player, or you know what, that guy was so underappreciated because of this, this, and this. But the power of the predictability is really where, you know, how, how can we, and, and the fact that we're gonna have so much information, spe specifically defensively, um, right at our fingertips, um, you know, can we, can we be predictive in that, okay, this, not, not next year, not, not in two years, but next week, can we make some adjustments that are going to allow us to gain an advantage and win a couple extra games than we're expecting to win? What do you think, Dave? What's you know, next? I've had time to think about it. I, mean, we're, we're, I know we're talking about pace of game, um, uh, but I think that uh, probably even going on forward, um, we're going to find more changes in um, the officiating of the game, um, I think, is where we'll probably see more changes. Now, what does that mean? I, I don't know if we're going to have um, the ability to have someone call balls and strikes or something called balls, balls and strikes um, to, to, I mean, this game is, it's, it's, it's forever changing. Um, and, you know, listening to our new commissioner, um, Manfred, um, it sounds like there are going to be more changes to the better of the game, to modernize the game. But, God, I'm, I'm such a traditional guy, I just can't get my, my, my mind around what that would possibly be. Um, but um, I know pace of the game um, is, is something that we're working on now, and I don't expect that the changes that we've made right now are the final changes. There will probably be more. You bring up the uh, you know, the strike zone. You know, what uh, what about that? You, would you would you want that? Would you well, want a I don't know a beep going through if it's a strike or or not? As a pitcher, <laughs> yes, I or would. Or a ball, as, yeah, <laughs> yeah. As, as, a, as a pitcher, I would. Um, I, I don't know how many how many how many how many days I spent um, after a start going back up to look at pitches that I made that I thought were good pitches and I say, you know, and I'm getting steamed out there and I mean literally pissed off and saying, God dang, well, you know, where's the pitch? You know, and if, if I can tell you a story, um, um, I, I remember I was pitching against Boston, against Roger, um, which was one of my, my, my biggest rivalries and we were in Boston and I, I, I was throwing pitches right down the middle of the plate. I mean, split in the middle of the plate. And he kept calling ball, ball, and I'm, Roger's getting the same pitch. And so after a while, I, I kept getting the ball, and the umpire was Chuck Mayweather. So getting the ball, tossing it back, getting the ball, tossing it back. <laughs> and Steiny, I got to a place, and never looking at him, but you know, I had my back to him, and I was saying, God, dang, man, you gotta, you gotta, you got to give me the same thing you're giving that guy. What in the heck is going on back there? And it got, got a little heated, although I was never looking at him. And then the final thing I said was, God dang, man, if it wasn't for affirmative action, you wouldn't even have a job. You know, so it was, it was just, for me, balls and strikes are the one thing that probably if they were going to make a change, I would be all on board for that calling whatever the proper ball and whatever the proper strike is, I would be all on board for that. Mm. What about you, Jeff? Yeah, you know, the, the way the, the strike zone is called, 
does not match the, the technical definition of it anymore, um, which is, I mean, which is okay. Uh, I think, you know, that the human element of the game um, factors in. You know, you could see it in spring training games. Um, and the umpires are, are, are getting out the cobwebs here in spring training as well, and, they, and there's times that they struggle. And, um, and just like the players are and, and the coaches are, um, the, uh, you know, I think baseball, Man, Commissioner Manfred's come out and said, well, we have to take a look at the strike zone and the low pitches and we really have to do something here. I, I think it's always most likely going to be a hot button topic um, unless there's something drastic decided, right? Unless there's some sort of, you know, foolproof automated system that this is a ball and this is a strike it's always going to be some sort of hot button topic. And, um, you know, I guess it just depends on where you fall on, on, on that, you know, on that line. Is do you, which, side of the, which side of that argument do you fall on? Do you care? And is it just a human, natural human element of the game that makes the game great? Or do, we, do you feel like it's, a, it's ruining the game or it's holding the game back in, in some way? Um, you know, I, I think that the changes that have been made to this point and the way that the umpires are held to a certain standard and are judged on a nightly basis and they have to review, if that stuff is actually going on, it's a, it's a very positive step in the right direction and, and they continue to be judged in those ways. Um, I mean, I think I would have to probably be, be convinced pretty heavily to have some sort of a, an automated robot umpire back there or something like that. Um, that would be a pretty, a pretty drastic step. Well, I think they've done so much review. I think what they've found is that, yeah, now they're, you know, they're calling the strike zone, and the strike zone is a little bigger than we may have thought. And now it's kind of, now you've got the high strike got guys out, the, the low strikes getting guys out. And, well, yeah. the corners especially, right? I mean, you think back to the days of Glavin and Maddox mm -hmm. and, and, and <laughs> some, of those, some of those corners that were, were incredibly, they were, those corners moved a lot, you know, and um, and I think really that's that's been one of the uh, the big fixes. Yeah, I don't know what you uh, uh, shock collar. We need a yeah. shock collar for balls <laughs> and strikes. <laughs> All right, Todd, we have a few minutes here, so let's uh, get to some of your questions here. You guys can just jump in here. How much different would a National League team's roster be if the National League adopts the designated hitter rule? Uh, How different would your planning be, your roster? I mean, it would be very different. Um, I shouldn't say very different. It, it, it actually allows you to, the same thing that you do in, a, in, a, in the American League. I mean, it allows you to carry a guy that is strictly a hitter, a guy that, you know, has become, either he's become a one-dimensional guy or he is a one-dimensional guy when you get him. I mean, it actually affects um, even probably how you draft um, for, for some organizations. Now you've got a guy that is a, a known weapon as a hitter. You've got him in the lineup. Um, so it does change your roster some. Um, you still have to do all the other things, though, to, to win a baseball game. You've got to defend. You've got to catch the ball. You've got to pitch. Um, but it does put you in a position where you've got a guy there that, that is an offensive force. It, I think it's a great question, actually. Um, it's because it's a values question. You know, what do you value as an organization? Are you, how do you value that DH spot? Are you going to utilize it to give some of your regular players rest and, and thus, you know, put somebody in uh, at that position? You know, I'm, for us, it would be too low, right? If we had the DH, are we going to, how often are we, would we play too low at, at that position versus you know, use them as a designated hitter. So, you know, what is, your, what is our value there in terms of how we want to utilize that spot? It's going to change how you, how you comprise that, those 25 players. Um, I, I, think, I think they would be different, but I think it would be different for probably individually for the 15 National League teams that exist. I think it, if they looked at it that way, they would, they would make different value decisions. Um, on how they expect to score runs and how they expect to, to utilize that spot to the best of their ability. Uh, next question, this is from uh, Sean Foreman of uh, Baseball Reference, uh, who is uh, one of the superheroes of the sport. Uh, when interviewing a manager, uh, what is the interview process? Uh, what types of testing and discussions are the most telling? Did you have that one first? I haven't done it, so I don't know. If you have any <laughs> suggestions, I'd be I'm more than... Uh, I've certainly hired a lot of, uh, I've yet to hire a major league manager because 
Walt Weiss is our guy, and, and he's a great, uh, a great baseball man and an a, and a even better human being. But um, having done a lot of uh, hiring and player development, and um, for us, it's, um, it's really about the person. I think that having an opinion, and a lot of times um, where, where from we sit, having an educated baseball opinion is uh, something that is in large supply. I mean, you can, the great thing about the game is, right, everybody's got an opinion, and, and there are a lot of people that have played the game for a long period of time and, and have great insight and great opinions, but what about them is going to fit with you and your culture? And what about them, where they're at in their lives? Um, are they ready to take on the responsibilities that, that you know, the job demands? Um, they might have all the information in the world and all the experience in the world, but if they're not ready to give that to the player, if they're not ready to give that to the organization, probably not the right people for our person for us. Well, we, we did. We went through the process. And uh, what we looked for um, when we made the decision or one of the criteria for a guy that was going to manage our team is, is how well he would lead. Um, leadership is very, very important. Um, communication um, is is very important. Um, being able to teach. Um, we've got players now that get to the big leagues sometimes much sooner than they should be um, at the major league level. And so it's very, very important that the, the man that manages the club is also still willing to teach players how to be major league, le major league players and how to play the game, how to go about their business, how to do the fundamental things, how to be a good teammate. Um, um, those were we also looked at the chemistry of our, of, of our clubhouse, that the players that were in our clubhouse, um, what were our players made of? And obviously, um, we are a young, young baseball team. And so um, the guy that we wanted um, was a guy that fit well with those guys and could motivate those guys and get those guys to do things that they didn't even know that they were capable of doing. And um, that's how we ended up with Chip Hill. Okay, another question here, and this is probably for a, 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 speaks for a lot of people out there. Since general managers have so many different backgrounds, what would you recommend for someone looking to become a general manager? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Dave. <laughs> you know, um, I, spent, um, I spent the majority of my time, my, my background is, is probably most different from anybody that's doing the job. Um, I started out as a player, um, and then I went from playing to, um, to management, and I was encouraged as, as a, as a, towards the end of my career to, to get on the field and learn to, um, to manage or coach, um, which I, I never wanted to, to take that path. Um, I think when I was, um, getting ready for retirement and looking at what I wanted to do past the game, I always looked at my team um, in the way that uh, I think a general manager would look at a team is the makeup of a team, the chemistry of a club, what pieces are missing, how do you make these pieces fit? And so to make a long story short, um, I think that you, you have to have a, a real sense of, of how to manage and evaluate people um, and it wouldn't hurt to understand how to evaluate players. Um, I think that um, organizational skills are, are a necessity. Um, working in an office, um, understanding how to manage an office, understanding how to manage people, how to read people and touch them when they need you to touch them. Um, you know, and those would, would be the, the keys for me. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. The caged answer that I usually give is never turn down, ne never turn your nose up at an opportunity because you don't know um, where that opportunity is going to lead you in, in terms of a job, but also where that opportunity is going to lead you in terms of a knowledge, base of knowledge that you're going to gain. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the generic caged answer. I think that um, underneath that, is, is the sense of you really need to know yourself well. Um, if you don't know what your skills are, and you don't know and have an appreciation for those skills, 
and know what it comes easy to you and know what you are, are, have done well in your, whether it's time in the game or time in some other industry. You're not going to know how to supplement that when you actually are put in charge of, of making a major league operation work. Um, it's really about, at the end of the day, managing people, um, communicating to people, but also supplementing your own skills with complementing your own skills with, with stuff that, that, or with people that know how to do stuff that you don't know how to do or don't have expertise in. And, um, you know, for me, for example, I've never, you know, 15 years in the industry, I've never one year, one season been an amateur scout. Now I've scouted, I have written reports, I have gone on trips with professional scouts, with amateur scouts, I've been to the Dominican, I've been to Latin, Mexico, but have I ever put in a full year's, no. I, can, I'm gonna, you know, I can't sit here and tell you I'm a scout. Um, but scouting is such a vital part of, so how do I now as a general manager make sure that, that I have an appreciation and have the best scouting, you know, that the Rockies have the best scouting department that we can possibly have. Um, that, that realization or that willingness to say, you know, as a GM or, or as a president of a club or as an owner that I need help in this area, that I need strong people to be enabled to, so that we can do this together and accomplish this together. If you can't do that, probably not going to last long in a job. Interesting. Um, this is for you, Dave. Coming from the agency side, uh, what skills have you been able to carry over to the team side? Um, well, the negotiations. I mean, we that is is a big part of it and you know since i've been here um, um i was able to uh, negotiate the tomas deal uh, which um, a lot of what i learned um, as an agent um, played a big part in, in being able to get that negotiation done and not only getting it done but getting it done at a, at a, at a cost that a lot of people were surprised we could get it done at um, of course, a lot of it had to do with um, us having an opportunity um, with our organization, but being able to negotiate um, has been a big part of it. Um, and before, it's, 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 it's strange because I was on the management side before, and so I had an opportunity to see what we do from management, then becoming an agent and using what I knew from management as an agent against management to have it all come back around and be back on the side. So uh, the biggest part for me is, is the negotiation skills. Um, I, I, that's the biggest part for me. And do you, what did that, I guess, yeah. So now you've been on both sides, does it make it easier? Does it make it easier to go through things because you know what the other side might be thinking or what they're striving for, or ha has it helped? Well, I, I do have a calmness um, in a negotiation. I actually feel very, very comfortable when we start talking numbers and we start talking about players and um, what a pay player should be paid, um, being able to look at comparable players and, and do that portion of it. I'm, I'm very, very comfortable in that area. Um, and um, I'd, I'd have to say that there's even a, a sense of confidence when it, when it comes to doing that part of the business. Okay. Another question here. Uh, when making a trade, how many calls? Who's in the room? With whom do you discuss the player? Um, it just depends. It really, it, it really depends. I, we have a pretty, um, uh, I think we have a pretty well-defined process. I mean, we... You know, trades are, there, there's so few trades that actually, you know, it's like one phone call, right, or two phone calls. Um, there's a, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of research that goes on. There's a lot of hemming and hawing. Sometimes there's sleepless nights. Sometimes there's early mornings, uh, you know, and, um, and, you know, just the way that we do it, we try to, we try to bounce everything off of each other as much as we can. Um, and without getting um, out of control and without getting ahead of ourselves or um, without losing the, the primary focus of, of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, we, we insert the, the devil's advocate into each one of our processes and, and make sure that we are looking at things from, from every, which ang you know, every angle that we can. We try to put ourselves in the shoes of the other team. 
and, and figure out what they're thinking so that we can try to think along with them. Um, so all of that, you, you know, all that takes time. I mean, and, and it takes people and it takes, you know, a collective brain power to do that. What about you, Dave? Wow. Well, um, Tony and I um, talk about trade. Uh, and that's probably where it starts. Um, and then we have our conversation. Um, and I uh, touch bases with our major league scouts, uh, which I've got three of them. Um, our pro scout, um, which would be uh, Mike Russell. Um, we speak with Mike. And then uh, organizationally, you want to talk to our minor league director, assistant GM, uh, Dijon Watson. And then after that, I try to network with the people that I know inside the industry, um, and even some people that may be outside of the industry. And when I say outside of the industry, um, you can talk to um, people that I know that have seen the player play before or may have some personal experience with the player that we're talking about. Um, but there's a lot of, of back and forth, and then after you go through that, then you look more at the reports. And after you look at the reports more, then normally I'll end up talking with uh, Tony again. And then um, at some point, um, if we're comfortable, then we make a decision. Come a long way, huh? I mean, it used to be you on the phone sounds good, right? Not you personally, but not all that long ago. I mean, have you talked about that? Or I mean, you, you don't go back all that long, 20, 30 years, but how different do you think that is these days where it's such a thought out process and getting everybody involved and on the decision and that sort of thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, you hear about the stories of, of deals being done on, on bar napkins, right? In the mm -hmm. hotel lobbies of the winter <laughs> meetings. And, um, you know, there's just, the rules and the money at stake oftentimes and, and what you can and cannot do has changed over time. And so, um, and certainly, you know, media, uh, I, mean, I think it would be probably remiss to, I mean, the, the Twitter and, and just the universe that we live in now has, has changed how we have to do business. Um, and there's so much access to so much information in real time that you have to account for that now. And, um, and so it's, it really, it's, I think it's, the process has probably evol evolved along with the technology, you know, and, and you know, it probably will be 10, 20 years from now, we'll probably be talking about something, something different than we are now, I imagine. Yeah, you, you bring that up in that one last thing then. Do you, uh, with that, with the, so much media and so much uh, scrutiny on it, do you, stay connected to it? Do you insulate yourself from it to not be affected by it? I try not to look at it. Um, even when I was a player, I tried not to, to look at the news um, or read the news. Um, I wanted to try to just tunnel my focus into what I was trying to get done. And a lot of times that can, it can throw you off. Um, if, you, if you're reading it, if you're hearing about it, um, it can throw you off. It can, it can get you off your path. Um, and, and even sometimes alter your, your thoughts on what, what you're trying to do. Um, so I, I try not to get involved in it. I try not to read. I try not to, I just try to stay away from it. Jeff? Completely agree. Um, I, I really have found no, no pure benefit to staying in touch or staying in tune with, with the, um, as, as harsh as it sounds, um, the opinions of the masses. It's, it's very difficult to glean daily value from that when you, when you have a structured decision-making process and you are, you are charged with making, uh, at the end of the day, unemotional, rational decisions on, on behalf of the organization. Um, you know, as Dave said, it, there's a lot of interference and, and you can get clouded pretty quickly. You see players do it, you see, you see all sorts of people in all walks of life do it, and so it's a choice that you make. And, um, as, as busy as our days are already, uh, if, if I devoted s uh, enough of my time or so much of my time to trying to stay on top of what people think, um, I'm, I'm probably going to be doing a pretty poor job at my job.
All right. Again, we appreciate your time, you guys coming out here. Congratulations on, uh, on your new jobs. Jeff Breidich, Dave Thank Stewart. You. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.